Okay, I believe we are recording. So, ah. Mike, thanks for agreeing to talk to me. I ought to tell all of the people that uh, might be logging in to listen or to watch this in conversation with that uh, we do know each other quite well and we normally are doing this with a large drink in hand, <laughs> talking all kinds of rubbish. But uh, one of the things I'm going to do today is ask you a few more serious questions than normal and in particular to tell us about your experiences as an entrepreneur. I will say up front, just so that I can embarrass you, that you are a successful entrepreneur and you are now enjoying the fruits of your labour as a um, lady who lunches. <laughs> so can you, Mike, first of all, just tell us about what you did, the company you built, give us the quick sort of five minute version of the story so we can then move on to your experiences of that. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Um... Yeah, I, I was sort of fairly unceremoniously booted out of my family home in Nottingham, where my parents were sick of me being a useless layabout. Um, and uh, I had a friend of a friend who's coming to Cheltenham. Uh, I thought I could sell things, having had a bit of experience at, at that, and um, ended up in Cheltenham in a job selling window blinds, which I didn't like very much, and had the good fortune to meet a couple of very good fellas who were setting out with a small business in the commercial catering world. And um, after meeting them socially, um, uh, they sort of saw, saw a bit of potential and um, offered me a job. And that was way back when I was 18. And that was my first role in the commercial kitchen world. Um, and very lucky to be found by two really bright fellas who saw potential in me and had an amazing grounding in quite a small business um, where they really put a lot of faith in me. And I learned from two guys who are a little bit older and really sort of learned the business from, from the ground up. Um, and then... That business was bought and I ended up getting an MD role of, of the company that bought us. Um, and ironically, the bit of the business that, that, that they bought that I liked the most, they liked the least. So after a, a sort of three or four years being a, an MD of a much bigger business and, and spending a lot of time in boardrooms and staring at spreadsheets, which wasn't really my forte, um, I put it to them that it might be a good idea to sell me the part of the business that I really liked and they liked least. Their, their, their focus was a, as a hire business and they understood hiring things, um, whereas I, I was always a seller and much more understood selling things. And I loved the design aspects of the, the business, the, the design and planning element of comm big commercial kitchens. Um, so I was in 2000, I bought out that division um, and formed Space Catering Equipment, um, which latterly got the grand grander title of Space Group as we sort of sp spread into different things. So, uh, yeah, that was 2000. Um, we started, we did, it was loss making as part of the, the PKL group, which is where I'd been MD. Um, the PKL group itself was a very profitable business and it was just that division was loss making and we um, yeah chucked the mortgage deeds in with NatWest and um, with a heavily pregnant wife wasn't overly impressed with that idea um, <laughs> and, um, and formed space and, and yeah by a bit of luck and a bit of good judgment and a lot of using skills that you know been learned in the first business I was in we turned it around very quickly and we actually made money in in year one which was a huge relief Mark. So let me just ask you a question about that so you 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 joined a company you sound like you you were a good salesman a good salesman is always worth their weight in gold because um, we all need good salesmen to run our businesses or to, to bring the business to the table um, 
the bit that caught your attention was a bit that they as a group were least interested in um which was kind of uh, the the opportunism that happens in real life these opportunities come along just so yeah. that we understand give us an idea of scale and where did you take the business from and to and how long did it take you from setting up the business to exit well we we had a we had a baseline turnover yeah um because the, the the business that they'd acquired, they, they sort of split up and they 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 separated what in those days we call design and planning. So that was the large kitchen project where you involved with the client very early on, design a, uh, a, a project from scratch, and then project manage it all the way through and, and deliver at the end of it a big shiny kitchen, and. Sorry, this is just to be clear. This, these are uh, commercial kitchens. Yeah. So uh, a small job in those days would probably been around 25, 30 grand, which would be a, a little pub or a, a small hotel or a, a bistro, something like that. And a big job would be 250,000, something like that. Okay. Um, and then a really, really big job. Um, which is sort of part of our story a little bit in that we we landed the account with Centre Parks quite early on. Right. Um, and um, I should hasten to add, that, you know, absolutely nothing to do with me or anyone in my organisation, but their biggest site at Elgin burnt to the ground, <laughs> including, including, I think, 16 kitchens. So... That was, that was that handy. Was, yeah, that was very handy in about year three or four, I think, because um, we were well, uh, well in with them then. But yeah, so we started the base turnover that we inherited was about two million, and it was losing about two hundred thousand a year. Oh. And in our first year, we did two and a half million, and we actually made two fifty. Wow! Um, so it was a great turnaround. We weren't paying ourselves very much, and it was run very lean. Um, and we sold it at about 25 million. Um, and as I say, we, we got, got the uh, new title space group because we diversified a little bit and we bought a, an ailing business um, that did all the fabrication for us and built big commercial counters and what have you. Um, we created a furniture division and a fit out division, a contracts division. So, yeah, to, to two and a half ish to. 25 mil um and uh, over what period of time uh 2000 uh, 16 years 16. started in 2000 okay. sold in 2016 to Nisbet. so so quite a meteoric rise and and uh, obviously a, a great success story and, and i i won't dwell too much on on the fact that you know everybody has good fortune along the way and and oh, you know, lots of people have written books about it but you make your own luck and sometimes you know somebody comes to you with something and you go wow okay that's great so i love your story about them but the elden burning down but you know what these things are meant to happen there's a serendipity in all of that um, yeah i mean by that stage it wasn't a game changer for us because we we'd grown you know yeah. that was about year four but it was at the time it was the biggest commercial catering contract in europe wow um, wow so it was it was a nice one to have yeah and we yeah. And we we were so involved with them as an account there, there wasn't much tendering to be done you know no, they, the, the, they the, wanted they, to do it that so, relationship. Yeah, you do get you do get luck and um I, I i think anyone anyone in business who says they've not benefited from some good fortune along the way is a fibber so so let me ask you a couple of questions around a lot of people that we work with that come to us for support are trying to work out uh, how to make their teams more effective, how to make their teams um, fit for purpose, if you like, how to optimize, how to make them optimally successful. Um, what, first of all, would you attribute your success to? Um, I mean, you and I, we haven't talked lots and lots about business, but, you know, because your business is people and people management, we have talked a bit about that in the past. And for me, it's all about the people. It's all about communication. It's all about um, alignment. Your team knowing where 
they're going. And I think that's the same in sport. I think it's the same in, in business. I think it's the same in in big clumsy organisations that that you know we all know don't do very well in this country. You know, you sort of nationalised industries. I, I, you know, if, if there was better communication, better alignment, if people understood where that the organization was going and their part, then I think, you know, everything would work a bit better. So effective communication, which which I'm, I'm glad you said that music to my ears, because, of course, it is fundamental. If, if, if everybody knows the state of the nation, if everybody knows the direction of travel um, and any other cliche I can think of, <laughs> but it, it, it's absolutely important that 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 things are communicated effectively and simply and regularly. And one of the problems we have in this modern era is uh, over communication. There's oversharing, you know, we all get a thousand emails a day and, you know, we don't read them. And then, so, so it, it's about the right amount of communication in the right way at the right time. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, as you built the company, did you deliberately or did you not build a team around you of centurions of trusted sort of lieutenants of did you have a core team that you could turn to and then you knew if you got hit by a bus they could still run the ship yeah de definitely um we had we had very low staff turnover it was always a focus you know right from from day one you know i picked up a slightly lost team and um right from day one it was right Come on, guys. You, we're now, now you're a team. Now you're in a team, and that this is where we're going to go, and this is how we're going to get there. And I, I, I didn't. I don't think I lost anyone in 16 years um, who was part of that real core team, um, and they all did very nicely out of it as well. You know, I hasten to add, I, they, we we introduced a, a very very um, good share scheme, and they all benefited when the business was sold. So. And most of them are still there, bizarrely. You know, I thought they a couple have gone with a you know a little bit of extra cash in the pockets, and um, but yeah, they're still soldiering on most of them. So, so I want to bring that on then to um, your biggest challenges. Now, obviously, as we've shared, we know each other very well, so I know some of your challenges. But can you share with us first of all uh, what you perceive were your biggest challenges in building the business, and then let's just bring in here some of the stuff about life challenges and, and whether that changed your view or whether etc cetera, etc cetera. um so challenges on the way up i think battling my personality which is to get involved in everything and micromanage which again, you know, in, in your world, you, you're so familiar with, you know, especially with entrepreneurs, I think. It's taking a step back, trusting people, letting them do their jobs. Um, and I definitely got better at, th at that. Um, I, I, I could, I still had it in me to get, you know, very cross that the, there was some mud on the, <laughs> the carpet on the way into the building or, you know, the lorry was a bit dirty, you know. I, 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 I just couldn't ignore stuff like that ever. Um, but I did get much better at it, and I did get better at delegating. So I think, yeah, managing myself really a, a little bit. Um, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be one of these great business leaders that runs British Airways or, um, you know, Acada or Sainsbury's. You know, it's it, that takes a different sort of person, a, a big. A much bigger picture person but i think i got better at you know not being a micromanager um and as the business accelerated you know you realize you've got these big accounts you've got to put someone in charge of them you've got to let them run and you, you've got to trust the trust the numbers you know and and follow that follow if it's doing well and we're making that margin and the, we're not getting the complaints and we're hitting the kpis leave it alone michael um and it's pushing myself away from the tiller, um, I think, was important to selling the business. Um, you know, it's hard. Big, bigger businesses are very wary of buying small businesses that are micromanaged by one person. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I very much pushed myself away from that MD role and, and it more into a chairman role. Just on um, that, just just jumping in before you continue the, this line of thought. 
did you find that you built the team around you in the cult of the personality of yourself or did you proactively seek out people who were best fit for purpose rather than that you liked them and they were like Mike Mellor? Uh, I'd like to say, you know, the intelligent answer, which is, you know, find, <laughs> find, find somebody who's better at doing the job than you and put them in position and then grow, grow, grow. And, uh, you know, we both know people who've done that very successfully. I, I think ours was probably slightly more cultish. You know, okay. we were this, this team that grew and got better and we, we, we grew around each other and helped each other out. And you, you know, you know, you know what people are good at and you know what people are not so good at. Um, and you, you try and play the right jobs to people's strengths. Um, towards the end, um, as you know, I, I got ill, had a, a, a nasty little brush with the big C. Uh, yes. In, in 2014 was my sort of horror year with surgery and treatment and all the rest of it. And at that stage, I, I brought in an MD and, you know, again, we, you know, we talk about luck. I, I, I brought Ian in anyway, uh, who, who was the, the MD to take away that figurehead role from me. And then, you know, ended up getting quite ill and yeah, what a surprise the ship didn't sink, you know? Yes. Um, and, and then you come back from all that. And I did work, I, uh, you know, even during treatment, I was working. Um, but it made me realise, you know, I can be a bit further back. Um, and you you can't help but dislike some of the decisions that are made in your, you know, in your absence. I wouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> but you but you have to you have to accept that. And um, hopefully if, if you've built the culture right, you know, people will will think, you know, not necessarily what would he have done, but what would we have done? If, if, if we were all together and sat around this boardroom table um and did, culturally did, what would we have done did the um uh, the your experience with the big c which in fact you and i talked about this before we started recording because as you know because we're good mates that i also had my brush recently with the big c and um, i'm going to say something that you might find strange but i think it made me more humble mm. and also it made me exactly what you said appreciate that actually it's okay to do things differently and trust other people because actually they they do care about you and they care about the business so absolutely i mean I, <laughs> it, 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 if you could roll back some years and say knowing what i know now would i take that illness out of my life i don't know if i would no you know, I get that. It, it's it's i think i'm a better person for it but you know taught me a lot taught me a lot about myself taught me a lot about my values and what I love and don't love and made me appreciate some of the things around me family wise which I wouldn't say I hadn't appreciated but you know I, you I look at them differently I hadn't realized how much I appreciated probably is, is the, yeah. um, the truth there um, yeah well it turns, you, it turns you into a soppy sod is the long story <laughs> isn't it Mark? I think it makes it turns you into a better human being, Mike. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, we, you and I share that experience, and it, you know it ties us together. But also, uh, I echo everything you've said. It really does make you just reflect and think. Yeah, okay, I'll maybe think about things differently. Uh, well, I wanted also, it just... you realise. I think you when in a business environment, and you know, many of the people you work with, they're very much working in the now, aren't they? It, yes. The, the what if is might be cancer or it might be uh something you know awful happening in their family or whatever but when you when you're sat in that big conference and it's all about the next stage of the business you know you're not you're not thinking about the what ifs um but when they suddenly come and punch you in the face it yeah. it, it, it makes it, it changes things and you know certainly from you know many of the people you talk to and work with their their end game is an exit but it's it's sometimes it's more about the, the points you score, you know, it's the, the pounds on the check or it's the hitting those targets and then, you know, how that defines their career. Um, and and a, a brush with a, with a serious illness perhaps changes what your, your reasons. Well, actually, I wanted to ask you, I mean, so spread it and taking the concept slightly wider than a serious illness. And uh, but 
uh, we do a lot of work these days in, in I'd call it managing adversity, uh, or to put it another way, a lot of people come to us and say, uh, these days you have to be much more resilient in order to succeed in business. Would you say that you and your team were particularly resilient? And was it something you worked on or did it just come in the territory of learning as you go, as you grow even? Um, I think they were a very resilient team. And I think, as I say, there was a culture there that, you know, we'll, we'll get on and we'll, we'll sort this. Um, and you had each other's backs, yeah? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I think, you know, we all, as you know, businesses grow and you start with that lovely, lovely, we're all mates together. And as you get bigger, you, 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 you remain a strong team, but you, you don't have those personal relationships and you don't work so closely with individuals. And, you know, I remember in the early days, you, I would go and see every job with the project managers if it was a, a big job. And I'd work very closely with the other directors on a day-to-day -day basis. And as, as you get bigger, you have to push away from that. And, but again, that, the, the culture you've built up, you know, there, hopefully there's still a knowledge that you, you know, you're all respecting what each other, uh, each other does. And um, yeah, so I think that makes you very resilient. So let's talk, let's talk about something that relates to, to what you just said, which is um, the, the, how you make people resilient, um, the ability to, to move away from the coal face yourself, but trust the people that you've put in place. Uh, trust is, is the platform for, for really everything. Effective teams, the success of effective teams is all predicated on trust. So you have yeah. to trust your team. So one of the concepts that comes out of that that we talk about a lot in our work is um, conflict, it becomes a tool of business and something that actually, if you trust people, you can have healthy conflict with them and healthy conflict is how you negotiate. It's how you find uh, a compromise in a situation. Um, would you say that conflict played its part in the development of your, your success? Yeah, I think that there's a particular director uh, who, if, if they're watching this, you know who you are, <laughs> <laughs> who, who was instrumental in in that business and and growing that business but you know as as it got bigger uh and as we worked together less closely you know that th there were, were there were times where you know no we're not we've got to do it like this and this and and uh you know she i think would say i i i was more um cantankerous and and forceful uh later on but it, it was a symptom of that larger business that you know we right this is the direction we're going we've got to go in this direction we've agreed it let's do it you know um and, and conflict's a hard word isn't it because it it it, it suggests it's it's a very it's a negative word i would say would you agree um well we we <laughs> There's a lot of discussion around the word conflict. Yes, it is a negative word, but it, it depends whether you define conflict as um, renegotiating your position or as war. If it's war, yeah. it's quite negative. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's used it, in the, it, on it the news. War. Okay, because on the war. news, they talk about conflict in the Middle East, and, yeah. and that's war. But yeah. a conflict in a boardroom or between a client and a supplier can be simply they're a bit intransigent about their payment terms. And we have this all the time because we work with the world's largest companies and we're quite a small consultancy. You know, they'll say to us, yes, we'd love you to do the work. We'll pay you on 90 days net and you can bill us at the end of the year's work. And you go, well, hang on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you have to have work, a bit of conflict, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, so I think what we're talking about here is conflict where you either have to be assertive in order to to because you know more than the person you're talking to or you have to have the trust and be able to somebody has to be able to conflict with you as the owner or the managing director and you have to sometimes step back and go actually i need to take their i need to listen to what they're saying um yeah i mean i, I don't think I, I genuinely honestly don't think i ever stopped listening um i but i do think i became more forceful towards the end of, yeah about, maybe driving certain things through um and and saying come on you know it, it, it's that team thing you know we're all in this boat together 
that's the way we're going. And if someone's not pulling in that direction, you know, it's yeah. going to go off course. A subject close to your heart after the recent <laughs> boat race. Yes, my I'll tell everyone who's listening that my nephew was in the boat race, the winning crew, the Cambridge crew on the bow. Yeah. I was very proud. And as an as an oarsman who rode for many years myself, I, I just watched that race and I was tired watching it. Maybe that's an age thing, but it yeah, was fantastic. Um, they, they know how to put themselves through it, don't they? Well, absolutely. I mean, that, that's that's about self-belief and and we're not we're not going to really go there today but actually it's a lovely segue well done mike um, <laughs> <laughs> i i did want to ask you very briefly if somebody said to you in a pub over a pint you know how would you define high performance or what does high performance mean to you in terms of a team how would you try and define that i would again always go back to the people so it's that alignment thing you know we're all pulling for the we know what we're pulling for we're all pulling for it everyone's going in the same direction we 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 talk no blame culture we work together and you know you're good at that you're good at that let's bring those together putting your hand up if you i'm not good at that i'd rather do that you know that it it was in my relatively small business, it was all about the people and getting them pulling in the, in the right direction. Communication, communication, communication all the way. And communication with customers. You know, I think that's massively yeah. overlooked area. Uh, and dare I say it, suppliers. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's equal, equal waiting. Not a waiting that people get. People think customers are really important. Suppliers, not so much. Well, try, yeah, running, yeah. Your, try running your business without suppliers. No, so. Uh, and, and again, you know, we had, we had one guy who looked after all our supplier contracts and we met with them at a high level a couple of times a year and, and they knew what we wanted out of them. And, and it, you know, ma massive trust, respect, you know, you're our guys, this is the way we're going. It's not all about price. You know, we were, we were never, ever the cheapest catering equipment company ever. And our suppliers were never ever the cheapest suppliers. So, you know, we took slightly more expensive goods and sold them for a little bit more money than other people were selling them at because, you know, we, we believed in the products and, and the backup and we could communicate that to the customers. Buy it from us, buy this good product from us, which will cost you more money, we will deliver it better and afterwards yeah. it will look after you better. Listen, um, pe people buy people and they buy service. And there's a lovely, well-known story about, and um, we learned this from having done some work years ago for Summerfield Supermarkets. I don't know if you remember them, but Summerfield, yeah, yeah. Uh, we did a conference from one day and they said, let us tell you how, how important customer service is over and above product. Uh, the product's got to be good. That's a baseline, okay? But they said, this is how people react in the, in the food retail sector. When they walk into a Summerfield Supermarket, and we've run out of avocados, they go, bloody Summerfield, they're useless, okay? When they walk into a Marks and Spencers and they've run out of avocados, they say, oh, we should have got here earlier, they've run out of avocados. <laughs> and they don't put any blame onto Marks and Spencers because the customer service is so good yeah, and the yeah. quality of the product is so good and it costs more money than Summerfield, but that's not even in the equation. No. The, mm. And therefore, what you've just said is it resonates enormously. Yeah, yeah. It's, so listen, um, this has been fantastic. And of course, you and I, uh, as is our won't, could, could wang on for hours and hours and <laughs> hours. Um, but I just want to finish up by asking you two things. Uh, one is, it's really about something you said at the beginning. You said that um, when you were started off, was it PKL, the company that you joined? P PKL was the company that bought. M Midwest is where I started as a Midwest. Lady. No, but PKL the, bought Midwest. I became MD of PKL and I bought out. Right. But well, you right. said there were two guys you were very lucky to have met who, yeah. and, and the, the reason I reference that is because um, mentoring and coaching is a big part of development and it's a big part of what we do. Well, not so much the mentoring as the coaching, but we put mentoring programs into, into place. And um, I think from what you're saying, mentoring played a very key part in your own success. Yeah, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a rough diamond yeah. um, who'd messed up his A-levels and, you know, shouldn't have messed his A-levels up, really, and, and 
bugging up any chances of going to university and all the rest of it. I, I was a, you know, I was a reasonably bright lad, but I, 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 I rough diamonds the, the best expression, I think. <laughs> Let's not go into details. The the mentoring um, allowed you to be kind of steered, if you like, or hundred percent guided, and yeah. and kind of opened the doors for you in a way, didn't it? Massively so. I mean, I learned so much from those guys, and they're still firm friends to this day. And I would say to some extent, I, they're still mentors, you know, or, yeah, well, or, or, or perhaps a little bit the other way around, you know, that they now would seek my advice. So on certain matters. Well, that's so interesting because there's, there's two things. One is that mentoring, uh, coaching, we always say it's expensive because it's usually the preserve of senior management teams and it's an expensive thing to engage in, although it's very valuable. But we always say that mentoring is priceless. You can't put a price on it because it goes no. on beyond the career. Most mentoring relationships that are successful continue. And in fact, um, Simon Sinek is a, you know, a very famous orator and thought leader out there in the sort of um, video sphere, you know, in, in, on the web and stuff. Um, he says of mentoring, he says the privilege he has now at being successful is that he will only choose mentoring relationships where he um, can mentor someone as long as they mentor him back. Yeah. So it's a, it's a two-way relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my last question, really, to, to, to finish up, Mike, and I really thank you again for doing this, was um, what would you say to your own kids if you were trying to give them great advice about how to be successful? Well, ironically, as, as you know, I, I've invested in a little bi of bicycles and bicycling have always been a passion of mine, and I invested in a little bicycle business Quella oh, sorry, Quella Bicycles. Yeah. <laughs> Quella, Q U E W L A. <laughs> yes. yes. Here is our website. <laughs> um, and my youngest daughter is, is currently working at Quella, having done a degree in hospitality, because uh, that sector's obviously had a rough time over the last year. Yes. And it, it is funny, you know, working with one of your offspring, because, you know, at home, parents are never right, are they? It's. Uh, so I, I have found myself giving advice to my daughter. Um, and uh, again, you know, as a parent, you, you won't be 100% listened to you, but a little bit of what they pretend not to listen to does stick in. And, and it is funny watching her develop. And I stay away from the business as much as possible, uh, A, because of that, you know, I don't want to interfere, and B, because I'm lazy. And um, you've earned the right. <laughs> yeah, and I and I see that development, and you know, you realise that actually a little bit is going in, and they that they, they they do follow you a, a little bit. Um, but yeah, what what I would always bang on about first is is communication. You know, why are you doing that? Have you told the people around you why you're doing it? Where's that going to lead you? Does everyone know why that? that's what you're up to and and making you know making mistakes because you you didn't seek that guidance you didn't check that it was the right thing to do it's, it's such a, a easy but silly thing to do you know a bit of confirmation along the way um with your with your your employers with your customers um and yeah it's it's very very interesting watching your your own you know going through through the stuff but yeah i my advice would be yeah hard work good comms good and good service you know but again that all comes from communication and, that, and i have good. to say i echo something you've just said which is um anybody who thinks that, that who lives in fear of making a mistake is kind of got it wrong because you learn more from adversity and from mistakes than you mm. do from anything else. And yeah. I speak from experience because uh, I've, I've ridden the, the roller coaster. Yeah, and I know it, you do. <laughs> so, you know, make some mistakes, learn from it. Um, yeah. If you make them again, find an excuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, again, you know, that thing of kids today are very frightened of blame. That yeah. they, that our millennials, that it's it's strange, isn't it? Because I think they've been brought brought up in a much more gentle environment than than we were as as, as older folk. You know, parent child relationships have changed a lot over the last 30, 40 years. Um, but they're still very, very 
they hate the idea of blame and and that's a dangerous thing because you you if, if you're not if you're so frightened of blame that you'll start to lie about your mistakes or not face up to your mistakes then you 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 you're in danger of not learning from them and i think you're in danger you know, of ending up like not about blame it's about putting your hand up i got that wrong why did i get it wrong learn 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 communicate learn <laughs> Right, well, I think I should now offer you a job because you've said all the right things and that's absolutely fabulous. Yes, well, um, um, there's, there's nothing left on the script, Mark. <laughs> no, you're supposed to say, oh, Poisson Rouge, they're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here's their website. <laughs> right, I'm going to stop recording.